Chapter 8 of Danger in Deep Space. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Danger in Deep Space by Carey Rockwell. Narrated by Sam Holloway. Chapter 8 there there shouted captain stephens into the mic aboard the jet boat circling around the station i think i see something bearing about seventy degrees to my left and up about twenty on the ecliptic do you see it scotty tom in the bucket seat of the jet boat strained his eyes but was unable to see over the control board terry scott in a second jet boat ten miles away answered quickly yes i think i see it sir good shouted stephens maybe we've found something he spoke to tom over his shoulder keeping his eye on the floating objects in the black void of space come to the starboard about one quarter full turn corbett and hold it then up about twenty-five degrees aye aye sir said tom he began to manoeuvre the small gnat-sized spacecraft to the proper position that's good shouted stephens now hold that let me see i think we've hit pay dirt from the right tom could see the red flash of the rockets of terry scott's jet boat which astro had volunteered to pilot coming into view as soon as order had been restored aboard the station search parties had been sent out to look for survivors carefully tom slowed the spacecraft in response to stephen's brief commands and soon came to a dead halt in space there hovering right above them visible through the crystal dome of the jet boat tom could see two space-suited figures floating effortlessly a moment later scott's craft came alongside and the two small ships were lashed together with magnetic lines tom and stephens hurriedly pulled on their space helmets they adjusted the valves regulating the oxygen supply in their suits and stephens slipped back the sliding top of the jet boat out on the hull he secured a line to a projecting ring and ordering Tom to stand by, he pushed himself off the ship into the bottomless void of space. The line trailing behind him, Stephens drifted towards the two helpless figures. He reached them in less than a minute, secured the line to their belts, and signalled Tom to haul in. Nearby, Terry Scott and Astro watched as the three figures were pulled to safety. Quickly, the top of the jet boat was closed, oxygen pressure in the craft was restored, and the four men took off their helmets. Whew! said loring i sure want to thank you for pulling us out of the deep we sure do sir added mason then with a quick look at loring he asked softly were there any other survivors stephen's face was grim not one after we untangled the mess we found bodies of two men it was pretty bad a little later something was spotted on the radar and we hoped there might be survivors luckily for you we came to look by the rings of saturn swore loring softly jardine and bangs were brave men they practically forced us to pile out when they saw they were going to crack up he turned to mason didn't they al yeah yeah sure brave men al mason agreed nothing to be done for them now of course said stephens what happened he paused and then added you don't have to tell me if you don't want to before you make out a report but i'd sure like to know i don't really know what happened sir said loring we had made a deal for a ride back to earth with jardine and were sleeping back on the cargo deck all of a sudden jardine came running in told us we were about to pile into the station and for us to suit up and get out we asked him about himself but he said he was going to stay and try to save the ship we piled out and well we saw the whole thing from out here like a big splash of light it must have been pretty bad on the station eh plenty bad but thanks to cadet corbett here there wasn't a single injury he warned everybody to get off that side of the station a lot of damage but no casualties don't you have any idea what made the ship crash asked tom quietly loring looked at tom but spoke to stephens i told you all i know sir can i expect to be questioned by everyone in the solar guard including cadets stephens bristled it was a civil question loring he said stiffly but you don't have to say anything if you don't want to loring and mason had not expected such a strong defence of the cadet and loring was quick to make amends i'm sorry i guess i'm still a bit shaken up he muttered stephens grunted it wasn't pretty you know watching that ship go up and not be able to do anything about it loring continued plaintively 
Jardine and Bangs, well, they're... they were sort of friends of mine. They were silent all the way back to the station, each with his own thoughts. Stefan's puzzling over the cause of the crash, Loring and Mason exchanging quick furtive glances and wondering how long their story would hold up, and Tom wondering how much Roger's changing the power circuits on the radar had to do with the crash of the ship. That's right, snapped Connell to the two enlisted spacemen. I said I wanted the radar section of the communications deck closed and sealed off until further investigations. You can hook up and use one of the monitors in the traffic control meantime. The two red-clad spacemen turned and walked away. Stefan stood to one side. Did you think that's carrying things a little too far, sir? He asked Connell. I'm doing this as much to protect Cadet Manning as I am to prosecute him. I want to be sure there was no connection between the crash of the Annie Jones and his tampering with the radar circuits, Connell replied. I guess you're right, sir, replied Stephens. Those two survivors, Loring and Mason, are having coffee in the mess if you want to talk to them. Did they change their story? asked Connell. None at all. They were hooking a ride back to Atom City and they were asleep in the cargo hold. Jardine, one of the pilots, came in and told them to pile out. They did. Hmm, mused Connell. I know those two, Loring and Mason. Had a little trouble with them recently on a trip to Tara. Suspended their papers. So if they were just hooking a ride, it might be they're telling the truth. I have a report here on the damage to the station, sir, if you'd like to listen to it, said Stephens, handing his superior a spool of audio tape. Good. Did you make out the report yourself? asked Connell. Yes, sir with the assistance of Terry Scott and Cadet Corbett. Good lad, that Corbett, said Connell, and paused. The whole unit is good. If it weren't for that hair-brained Manning, I'd say they had as bright a future in the Solar Guard as any unit I've seen. I'll buy that, sir, said Stephens with a smile. That Corbett picked up traffic control operations like a duck takes to water. And it's been a long time since Genledge and the power deck raved about a cadet the way he does about Astro. Connell smiled. He was reluctant to press for an investigation of the radar deck, knowing that if he did, it would mean a damaging black mark against Manning. But justice was justice, and Connell came closer to worshipping justice than anything else in space. Connell placed the spool of tape in the audiograph and settled in a chair to listen. He didn't like the entire affair. He didn't like to think of losing a cadet of Manning's ability because of one stupid mistake. He had recommended a thorough investigation. There was no other way. If Manning was cleared of the responsibility for the crash, he was free, and it would not show up against his record. If he wasn't, however, then he'd have to pay. Yes, thought Connells to himself, as Stefan's voice began to crackle harshly on the audiograph. If Manning was guilty, then Manning would most certainly pay. Connell would see to that. Deep in the heart of the space station, Loring and Mason were huddled over steaming cups of coffee, whispering to each other cautiously. One more coffee, Mason? asked Loring. Who wants coffee when there's going to be a solar guard investigation? whined Mason. Suppose they find out something. Relax, will you? muttered Loring reassuringly. Connell doesn't suspect a thing. Besides, he has that cadet under arrest. Yeah, argued Mason. But you don't know these guys at Space Academy. All this honor stuff, it's not like a regular investigation. They don't stop digging until they dig up real facts. They'll find out we stowed away and... Loring calmly added cream and sugar to his coffee. They can't prove a thing. Jardine and Bangs are dead, and the ship's nothing but a pile of junk. They'll find out, I tell you, and now we've got murder on our hands. A door behind Mason suddenly opened, and Stephens appeared. Shut up, you fool, Loring hissed. He turned blandly to face Stephens. Well, Captain, glad you came. I wanted to talk to you about getting us transportation back to Venusport. You'll just have to wait for the jetliner from Earth, said Stephens. See me in about two hours. Right now, I've got to make arrangements for the investigation of the crash. Sure, sir, said Loring. Um, say, Captain, what do you expect the investigation to turn up? The true facts replied Stephens. Whether the crash was due to the negligence of Cadet Manning or something that happened on the ship. Then you really think the cadet may be responsible? asked Loring softly. He admits to negligence, and the Annie Jones is a lot of evidence, said Stephens with a shrug, and walked out. There's our answer, 
said Loring triumphantly. Come on. Where are we going? asked Mason. We're going to have a little talk with our fall guy. Ah, uh, sit down, Roger, said Astro. Everything will be okay. Yeah, agreed Tom. You're just wearing out the deck and your nerves walking back and forth like that. Everything will be okay. Tom tried hard to keep any apprehension out of his voice. Nothing will make those two guys on the spaceship okay, said Roger. He kicked viciously at a stool and sat down on the side of his bunk. Since the crash, Roger had been confined to his quarters, with Tom and Astro bringing him his meals. Tom had watched his unit mate grow more and more bitter over the turn of events and was afraid Roger would do something rash. The central communicator over the door suddenly buzzed and the three cadets waited for the announcement. Cadets Corbett and Astro report to rocket cruiser Polaris for indoctrination on hyperdrive. On the double, by order of Major Connell. Tom and Astro got up. Astro found it hard to hide his eagerness to begin indoctrination on hyperdrive, and it was only his deep concern for Roger that kept him from letting out one of his bull-throated bellows. Take it easy, Roger, said Tom. The investigation will be over and we'll be on our way to Tara before you know it. Yay, Space Romeo, growled Astro. Crawl in the sack and rest your bones. You're lucky you can miss this. Roger managed a weak smile. I'll be OK. Go ahead and learn about that hyperdrive before you explode. There was an awkward moment while the three cadets stared at one another. The deep friendship between them didn't need to be expressed in words. Abruptly, Tom and Astro turned and left the room. Roger stared at the closed door for a moment and then flopped on his bunk. He closed his eyes and tried to go to sleep. Whatever happened, he thought, it wouldn't do him any good to knock himself out. As he lay there thinking back to the first months at Space Academy when he'd met Tom and Astro, he heard a knock at the door and he turned to see the steel hatch slide back stealthily. He jumped up. Loring stuck his head inside the door. You alone, Manning? He asked. Yeah, who are you? Asked Roger. My name's Loring, and this is my space buddy, Al Mason. We were on the Annie Jones. Roger's eyes lighted up. Then you know I'm not responsible for the crash, said Roger. I wouldn't say that, kid, said Loring grimly. I wouldn't say that at all. What do you mean? demanded Roger. A shame. Loring shook his head. Young fella like you winding up on the prison asteroid? Prison asteroid? asked Roger stupidly. Yeah, grunted Loring. Have you ever seen one of them joints, Manning? They work from noon to midnight. Then they give you synthetic food to eat because it costs too much to haul up solid grub. Once you've been on the prison rock, you can't ever blast off again. You're washed up as a spaceman. Think you like that? Why, why, what's that got to do with me? Asked Roger. Just this kid. After the investigation, they'll find out your radar scope wasn't working right. Then they'll come to me and ask me what happened aboard the Annie Jones. Well? Demanded Roger. What did happen? Loring glanced at Mason. Just this kid. Jardine and Bangs were on the teleceiver and the radar for 15 minutes trying to pick up your beam. But there wasn't any, because you had it fouled up. Roger sat down on the side of the bunk and stared at the two men. If what they said was true, Roger knew there could only be one outcome to the investigation. Why are you telling me this? asked Roger quietly. Very simple. I don't like to see anyone go to the prison rock. Are you... Roger hesitated. Are you suggesting that I escape? Loring and Mason got up and walked to the door. Loring turned back to face Roger. I'm not suggesting anything, Manning, he said. You're a big boy and should know what's good for you, but... He paused and measured his words carefully. If I were you, I wouldn't wait around for Connell or anyone else to blast my life to pieces by sending me to a prison for one little mistake. The hatch slid closed behind the two spacemen. Roger stood up and began packing a small spaceman's bag. There was a jetliner coming in from Atom City that would make a stop at Venusport. He glanced at his watch. Thirty minutes. He didn't have much time. End of chapter 8